Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here. Welcome to those joining us uh, at the 01 Crossroads in Highland Park. So this is historically the quietest, lowest attendance weekend of the year, but we are trying to ramp up. As you are hearing already today, things are starting to happen. Things are be- gearing up. Had a baptism last night. We've got baptisms happening at some other campuses today. And then tonight uh, at the Lake Forest campus, we have this uh, concert and um, not all of Andy's songs are comedy songs, but there's some of that there, so um, hope that you can join us tonight. So it was uh, not quite 30 years ago when our oldest son, Austin, was just a little tyke, um, that he had a neighbor, we had, we had a neighbor kid, a little bit older than Austin, whose name was Josh, and Josh delighted in throwing things into our tree. Now, if you have a kids, especially boys, I guess, you expect that kites and frisbees and the occasional child will get stuck in a tree. Josh went way beyond that. If Josh could pick it up, he was trying to throw it in our tree. So clothes, Hot Wheel tracks, books, all kinds of things were always in our tree. It was not a good look. And I spent a lot of time trying to get these things out of the tree. And so it wasn't all that surprising when one day Austin comes running in and he says, Josh just threw my baseball glove into the tree. So I went out there. What what I was surprised about is how high up in the tree Josh had gotten the baseball glove. And I'm I'm thinking, okay, way past a ladder and there's all these branches around this thing. So I'm going to spend an hour out here with the baseball, throwing it up there, trying to hit the glove and knock it off. And I go, Josh, doggone it, stop throwing Austin's stuff in our tree. You can throw your own stuff in your tree all you want. Don't throw his stuff in our tree. Now, how am I supposed to get this down? At which point, Austin, who's about three and a half, says, well, I can get it down. I go, oh, really? How how are you going to do that? He goes, well, I'll just fly up there and get it. (laughs) Go right ahead. And he says, well, I'll, I'll need my super fly coat. So he had a coat. It was not... Not a Superman coat. It was a little gray corduroy jacket. No cape, no, you know, Superman insignia on it. He just called it his Superfly coat. He says, I need my Superfly coat. I go, well, go get your Superfly coat. So he goes in. It's, it's sort of late summer, so it's not exactly winter coat time, but he finds his coat, and he comes watching out. Now, it had taken him a little bit of time, and word had gotten out that Austin was going to fly, and so there are now a whole group of neighborhood kids that are here. He comes out looking very determined. He's going to save the day. And, and he comes down, he looks at it, and he says, I think I need a little bit of a running start. Go, well, we'll clear the path here. So we clear a little path, and uh, he takes about four steps and jumps about this high and is shocked. And he sort of looks and says, huh, let me do it again. And he backs up and he does it again, and, and then he goes... I guess I can't fly. So here's the deal. If all he needed to fly was the belief that he could fly, he could have flown because he believed it. If all we need is faith, that we can do things, how does that work? What is faith? What are we actually talking about here? So as has been mentioned, we're beginning a new series. This is is called Planted, and it's going to sort of fill in over the course of the next year around other series that we're going to do. It grows out of my uh, my sabbatical, which in turn was growing out of a desire to write some letters to a man at one of our campuses who had just come to faith. And uh, like many in the suburbs uh, around Chicago, This is a person who had a graduate level education in a professional field, but sort of a grade school understanding of of Jesus. And so, you know, he he had a a big job and a big education, and so he was conversant in history and literature and a little bit of philosophy, but almost no understanding of spiritual ideas. 
And so uh, I wanted to write something, I wanted to find something for him, and I was really frustrated. We were meeting, and I was frustrated. I couldn't quite find the right thing. And so I had this idea that on my sabbatical, the first thing I was going to do is I was going to write him seven letters about new faith in Christ. And about two hours into my sabbatical, I had identified that I needed to write 40 letters, not seven, that this was sort of complicated because uh, when it comes to spiritual foundational truths, they're not simple. So if you want to learn math, you start with simple things. Two plus two equals four. You, you, you master that before you go on to differential equations. If, if, you, if you're learning to read, you learn your ABCs, and then you learn, you know, you read, read books like One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish before you go to the Brothers Karamazov. You start simple, and then gradually over time you build the big. But when it comes to issues of faith, there's a sense in which the foundation that you're building on are some really big, radical, shocking, different ideas about who we are, where we came from, what's expected of us, what happens when we die, and how we know anything. And so um, it, it just proved to be a lot more challenging than I was initially expecting. And I spent my entire sabbatical working on these 40 letters, and they're a long way from being done. Uh, but from time to time, I want to bring these out because I want to be sure that, that, that especially those that are new to faith get planted, and those that are planted are growing. And so today, the topic is faith, which is foundational. And, and we're told in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk that uh, the just will live by faith. And in Ephesians, we hear that we are saved by grace through faith. And in Hebrews, we're told that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is obviously absolutely critical that we get it right. But when you start to listen you realize that people are using the word faith to mean a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. And so we have to step back and unpack this idea of faith. What is faith? So <clears throat> what I want to do is, is, is boundary this a little bit because I want to be, be clear. We're talking about Christian faith. So every, everybody, it turns out, has faith, even those who say they don't. I have faith, you have faith. Richard Dawkins, who sort of makes his living writing against faith, has faith. Everybody has faith. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not simply talking about the fact that we believe things we don't understand, like you know, how my iPhone works or you know, that an airplane is going to fly. I mean, I, I, I sort of understand these things, but I don't really understand them. So I, I accept that the plane I sit in is going to take off by faith, in a sense. I'm not talking about that. And, and uh, I'm, also, uh, uh, I'm also not talking about some other aspects of generic faith. The fact that, that we all, I'm talking about the fact that we all just accept some things without any ultimate foundation. At the end of every worldview, at the bottom of every worldview, there are things that we simply choose to believe. So scientists will push back on this and say, no, I only, I'm, I'm a reasonable person. I was talking with somebody just the other week who said, I, 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 I am not a person of faith. I only base things on evidence. Okay, but then we have scientists saying things like Carl Sagan, the cosmos is all there is and all there was and all there ever will be. Right? It's, a, it's a classic claim made by scientists. I'm just going to look at what I can what I can touch. Well, Sagan's comment, by the way, is a statement of faith. It's not anything that he can prove. And we can go all the way back to Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason to, to, to show that, that, that there is no ability to use reason and science to prove that there is no spiritual dimension. There's a whole lot that we could talk about when it comes to faith. I want us to focus on understanding Christian faith, faith in Jesus. Right, so, the, so there's a sense in which the, the Bible is written to help us cultivate a very specific set of beliefs to affirm a handful of historic claims about God loving us and sending his son and that Jesus being that son. And, and what we want to do is we want to see our trust and confidence 
in this specific set of claims go forward. So um, last night here at the Lake Forest campus, we had uh, a baptism and we baptized 20, 25 people. And it's not uncommon uh, before baptisms to ask the candidates for baptism to uh, affirm their faith. And in particular, what has often happened historically, to, to, because it's not just faith in faith, it's not just a generic faith that we're asking them to affirm, but it's, it's, it's to lean into the Apostles' Creed. There is a historic corpus of beliefs, and the Apostles' Creed, which was not written by the Apostles, but it's sort of written to summarize the Apostles' teaching, is what we are stating our faith in. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Right? We, we go through this list of central tenets. I want us to, to understand a little bit better what the historic Christian faith is, what it means to have faith, and how we nurture and grow that faith. And, and so that's what I want, uh, I want to get us launched on. And it's, it's also, by the way, this is, there's a sense in which this is the reason we have a Bible. <laughs> so the gospel writers, Luke in particular, but we also get it with John, they're saying, I am writing these things to persuade you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? What is faith. Hebrews 11 opens this hall of faith passage. It opens, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It is a, it is a little bit more of a description chapter. It, it then gives it examples of all these people of, of faith. What exactly is the faith that it is celebrating? Well, <clears throat> Our working definition for today is that faith is belief in Christ and the corresponding actions that grow out of that belief. It is belief in the historic person and work of Christ and it is the corresponding actions that grow out of that belief. I think a more helpful way to communicate this is to, is to be really clear about what we're not talking about. Because when I listen carefully to people talking about faith, or when I hear, listen to people talking against faith, I hear them saying a whole bunch of things, and I go, that's not, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. So I have six things that I want to be sure you understand faith is not. Number one, faith is not believing things that you know are not true. Back in the 30s, there was a, a very popular journalist, uh, Menchin, Menken, who, who wrote against faith, sort of a Richard Dawkins kind of character, and he wrote against faith, and he said, faith is the illogical belief in the improbable. Well, there's a sense in which I want to say, okay, because it is a crazy idea that God loves me <laughs> and that God would send his son to die for me. That's a, that is an improbable, almost unthinkable, unbelievable kind of thing. But that's not what he was talking about. He says faith is the, is the illogical belief in the improbable. No, that's not faith. I hear some people suggest that faith is a feeling that we have, sort of an inner sense of conviction that, that grows out of it. And I go, well, if faith is a feeling, then Austin, when he was three, should have been able to fly because he was really believing it and felt it inside. So faith is not against feelings, and I, I think that over time, our feelings come to line up more and more with our faith and our convictions. But our feelings, our emotions, just like our intellect, just like our bodies, everything has been broken by sin. So it's not, it's not a help, helpful thing to say, my faith is, is equated with my feelings. A third thing that faith is not is faith is not sort of a psychological certitude. I am absolutely 100% convinced. So when we were going through the Psalm series uh, earlier this summer, I, I gave a sermon on doubt. And I said, look, we, we are, 
there's a lot that gets written about and even to some extent celebrated about doubt and about working through our questions and our, our concerns. And so there's a sense in which being a person of faith doesn't mean that you don't have some doubt. A fourth thing that faith is not. Faith is not a leap in the dark. So faith is not certitude. It's not working out a math problem and having absolute conviction. But faith is also not a, a blind leap into the unknown. So in the Hebrews passage, Hebrews 11, we have all these people who are people of faith, who are celebrated. For instance, Moses. So Moses makes it into this hall of fame of faith. And we can think about Moses' faith. And one of the things when you start to rehearse the fact that Moses is called by God is to realize he was called by God in a way in which he was offered reasons to trust God. So initially, he appears in the form of a bush that is not consumed. And then there's the whole ten plagues deal with Pharaoh, where there's a whole bunch of things God says he's going to do, and then he does them. Right? So, so we see this idea that there is evidence. And in fact, in John chapter 14, verse 11, Jesus says, believe, in, believe me when I tell you that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or believe on the basis of the miracles I have done. Right? Believe me when I tell you, trust me when I tell you that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or believe on the basis of the miracles that I've done. Because Jesus has done a whole bunch of miracles throughout the Gospels, right? We, we saw this in our Luke study that, that, that first... Jesus demonstrates his power over sin, and then he demonstrates power over, over evil, and then he dem demonstrates power over death, and he demonstrates power over nature. He's, demonstrating, he's doing all these things not to fix the world, because those were, in one sense, temporary fixes, very specifically bound geographically. He was doing those to show people, I've got all this power. I can do these miracles because I am God. And so he's, there's evidence that gets offered to us we are not expected to take a blind, flying leap into the dark. There are reasons we are given to place our faith in Christ. The Bible is, is, is one of the first places that we go. It is, it is full of truth that doesn't just, we don't just read about it. There's a sense in which the Bible reads us as we read it. There's the person of Christ, his life, his, the historical arguments for the resurrection. There's fulfilled prophecy. There is, there is a sense that we have in our heart that we can't get rid of that there is a God. I, I'm in um, ongoing conversations with a man who for a few decades has been denying that there is a God. And now he's sort of come back and he's saying, well, you know, there's no God, but Talk to me more about what this God would be like. Like, how do I know? And I'm saying, look, you, you have a sense. We, we read this in Romans. You have a sense in which there's a God. We can deny it. You can, you can hold a beach ball underwater, but it takes effort. And if you let go, it pops up again. And I said, so you've been holding it down, but I go, here's the, here's the truth. There's, there's some truth that is written on your heart that there is a God. And so uh, we have evidence in a variety of different ways. In Hebrews 11, 2, there's, a, there's a, a specific verse that says, By faith we know, by faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's hand. Now, there's this whole new, whole other category of evidence for the, the, the claims that get made by Scripture, the claims around Christ, that we see in creation. So there are things that we know about a creator when we look at creation. And I'm, I'm not going to go long and deep into this, but there's two that, that immediately pop up. One is called the cosmological argument. And the cosmological argument says that if something exists, then we know that it is either eternal, it's always existed, or it, at some point it created itself and came into being, or it was created by something else that preceded it, which ultimately would have to be eternal Otherwise, we just keep backing up. And so 
If something exists, then it's either eternal or it created itself or it was created by something that's eternal. And then the cosmological argument notes that science says the universe is not eternal. Right? It's, it's, if we were eternal, then we'd be in heat death by now. The sun would have burned up all its hydrogen and, and it, we would not be here. The universe had a beginning 17, 20 billion years ago, whenever it was, the universe had a beginning. So it either created itself or it was created by something eternal. So we used to think that things could create themselves. And the, uh, the example that everybody used was mold. You got a piece of bread and one day it's bread and the next day life has sprouted up on it. And it came out of nowhere. Life can just create itself out of nothing. Well, then science gets a little bit more sophisticated and they said, no, actually there was a mold spore that landed on this bread and nothing creates nothing. Now, if you listen, what you hear a lot of scientists saying is in fact that nothing created something. That the universe is the, is the result of space plus time plus chance. Okay, no, think about this. Space. If I give you a, a box of space, and all the time you want, and nothing happens, you don't add anything to that box, what's in that box after two hours or 2,000 years? Nothing. Chance, the, chance is not an agent that changes something. It's just a, it's a description of a mathematical probability. But we hear all the time, well, the universe was created by space plus time plus chance. We don't really understand it. Well, <laughs> that's because there's no chance that this could happen. So the cosmological argument, not a proof, but the cosmological argument su suggests that the universe testifies to a creator. The, the second argument that, that you can hear about and read about that has really come on in the last 20 years is called the teleological argument or the watchmaker argument, the argument by design, Paley's argument, lots of different names. But it says if you're walking, th used to be if you're walking through the woods and you find a watch, we'll update it. If you're walking through the woods and you find an iPhone, you, you assume there is an iPhone maker. You don't look at the, the iPhone and say, wow, all these things just fell together randomly without any kind of intelligence, and it does all these things. Isn't that amazing? Well, as it turns out, in the last 20 years, as we understand more and more about the universe and how it works and all these gravitational forces and all these constants about chemicals and other things, they, they say, this universe is so finely tuned. It's, it's, it's 10 million times more complicated than an iPhone. And there's just no chance that it came together by chance. There is intelligence behind it. So there's more there. Um, and it, there's a whole field of theological study that looks at these evidences. I, I just want to say faith is not a leap in the dark. Faith is not believing things you know are not true. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not certitude. Faith is not a leap in the dark. Uh, the fifth thing that I want to say is that faith is not magic. And, and I, I stress this because today, lots of people without saying faith is magic act as though faith is magic. So, uh, look, it is a wonderful thing to live in a country where we can believe whatever we want to believe. That's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. However, just because we're free to believe whatever we want to believe does not mean whatever we believe is true. Right? And, and, and people act as though it is. If you're sincere in your beliefs, if you're sincere, that's all that matters, then it's true for you. Well, that is certainly not the Christian understanding of faith. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and says, look, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then the whole thing is a joke. It's off. It's wrong. And, and, and I, 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 want to under, I, I want you to understand that there is a big difference between affirming every person or affirming that person's right to believe something and affirming what they believe. People all have value. Not all ideas have value. Some ideas are bad ideas. 
And so we need to understand that faith is not magic. So little illustration on this. Um, imagine I have a jar of jelly beans. And it's a big jar and it's full of jelly beans. And I ask, okay, I'm going to take five people at random. How many jelly beans do you think are in the jar? Right? So everybody, I get five people and they guess how many jelly beans they think are in the jar. And I write, I write down their numbers. And then I say, okay, I want the same five people. I want to know your favorite song. So they write down, they give me their favorite song and I write it down. I go, okay, so the jelly bean jar actually has 463 jelly beans in it. So then we look to see who, who basically wins the, the, that contest. And then I say, okay, now it comes to the favorite song. Who has the best song? Who has the right answer here? People go, mm, you can't do that. You can't do that. that that's not the way it works. I go, oh, okay, so you're free. People are free to have their, their preferences on favorite song. But there's an actual number of jelly beans in the jar. Okay. Then the real question. When it comes to faith, is picking your faith more like naming the number of jelly beans in the jar or is it more like naming your favorite song? Today, 95% of people will say, it's about picking your favorite song. <laughs> but it's not. Right? It's about being right. God is who God is. God is who God is. And the Bible makes it clear. He is not open for us redefining him and then expecting that he is going to adjust to our hopes. Faith is not magic. It doesn't change reality. Last point, faith is also not belief. Now, belief and faith are similar, but belief stops short of faith. Belief is an intellectual affirmation of, of an idea. Faith requires action. The, the famous illustration here used over and over is about Blonda and this tightrope walker 100 years ago. They, they strung a, a tightrope across Niagara Falls and he walked back and forth and then he walked over, stopped in the middle and, you know, juggles and then he stops in the middle and takes a nap and then he stops in the middle, literally sets up a stove, cooks an omelet, eats breakfast, comes back. And then one time he walked uh, over, pushed a wheelbarrow uh, over and back. When he gets back uh, to the American side, there's a crowd there, and they're all clapping. And he says, how many of you believe I could do it again? And everybody's hands goes up. Great. Who wants to be in the wheelbarrow? Everybody's hand comes down. They believe that he can do it again, but they don't have faith that he can do it again. Faith has a corresponding action to it. Now, <clears throat> Look, there is so much more that could be or should be said about faith. Uh, I think uh, it's important that you understand that you want your faith to be right because it is shaping not only eternity, but it's shaping all of your life, your sort of, your belief system. Many people, we have an illustration here. Can we pull this up? Uh, can we pull up the, yes, so... Many people imagine their life looks a little bit like a pie chart. You know, there's various things in my life, work, family, leisure, other friends, health. And then when, when I become a person of faith, when I suddenly decide I'm going to believe something, I'm going to be a Christ follower, that that gets added into our life. So go to the next slide. So the one on the left is... Uh, uh, the one on the left is the first slide that you saw. And then in the middle you see adding faith, a, a wedge of faith. And then the expectation is, okay, well, if I grow in Christ's likeness, if I become a more serious Christian, then that pie wedge is going to grow. Okay? This is not at all what biblical faith is like. Biblical faith is not a wedge of the pie. Biblical faith is the pie pan. Or, to state this a little differently, biblical faith or faith at all becomes like glasses that you put on and you see everything through the context of those glasses. So it is imperative that our faith is right because it shapes everything 
about us. I, I would like you to be sure that you understand that growing your faith is your responsibility, not mine. If you come to Christ Church, I and others on staff and leaders and volunteers of all sorts will do everything we can to help your faith grow. But at the end of the day, <laughs> this is your responsibility. As a matter of fact, I would say it's not just your responsibility, it's also your opportunity. Because the more we grow in Christ likeness, the more we yield our life to the Spirit of God, the better life works. The more we have joy and peace and love and patience, things that make life work. I would, I would like to spend time noting that, that faith grows by, by reading Scripture and engaging in spiritual practices. I'd like you to understand how important your friends are in terms of your faith growing. But I want to I double back to end with this final point that faith is not simply belief. Faith goes beyond belief. And some of you might in fact believe that Jesus is, Christ, is, is Lord and God, that, that the Christian faith is, is essentially true. You would say, yeah, I would affirm the Apostles' Creed. But let's be honest, there's not a lot of reason to think you've placed your faith in Christ. So maybe you haven't. And in a second, if that's the case, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that, to, em to embrace the gift of faith that comes from God. Christianity is not this I do, it's this he did. It is, it is accepting the love of God extended to you and me through Jesus Christ his Son, our Lord. So it's possible that you believe this, but you haven't actually made it your own. It's also possible that you have made it your own, but you just haven't done anything since then. All right? and, and so I want to say, look, the faith that you have, in one sense, is the faith that you show. Now you, can, you can actually fake it, and it can look like you're someplace that you're not, but it's never sort of less than the faith that you show. <laughs> and so, have you taken the next steps? I was excited. As I said, last night we had 20, 25 people step forward to be baptized. It's one of the commitments that we make if we say, I'm in. I'm a Christ follower. I'm going to be a Christ follower. Okay, if you're going to be a Christ follower, what are the things that Christ says to do? And being baptized is one of them. And it's not that baptism saves us. We're not, we're not washed clean by the water of the baptism. Uh, it, it, but it's a mysterious sacramental activity that we engage in because Jesus said, you want to identify with me? Here's one of the ways you identify with me. You are baptized. And we, we are sort of saying, if I'm going to be a Christ follower, then the things that he says I need to do. I need to live my life shaped by the things that he has taught and the things that he has modeled. So maybe you have been made a commitment for Christ. Maybe you've been baptized. I don't, I don't know what a next step would be. I don't, I don't know. Perhaps you want to talk with someone. This is the, we're, we're heading, tragically, heading into the fall. All these things ramp up. More opportunities to serve, small groups. There's, there's prayer workshops. There's all kinds of things that are happening. So maybe there's some obvious next steps for you as you are thinking about what the next year of your life is going to look like. This is really, in, in, in my way of thinking, uh, September 1 is a whole lot more the start of the year than January 1. So this is a, there's an opportunity now to sort of do this, this gut check and to say, where am I? How? What is a life of faith? What would a life of following Jesus look like for me now? What is a next step I want to take? I will remind you that we offer spiritual check-ins at all the campuses, an opportunity to talk with somebody about where you're at and what's going on in your life. But I want to say to you, look, <laughs> uh, the just live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Christian faith is about, about saying, I am a Christ follower. I am putting my weight down. I am ordering my day around Jesus and the things that he has taught and done. 
and I will be shaped by him. So I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to give those of you who maybe have not made that step an opportunity to do that. I'm going to pray for the rest of us as well. Let's pray. Father, uh, I, I, I suspect I speak for many, if not most, or all who say we do want to be people of, of greater faith and faith in the things that are true and real and faith in you. And so I want to pray, um, first of all, for those who have not made that decision ever, uh, that you would meet with them now. And if this is your understanding of where you're at or you want to make sure that you are a Christ follower, I would encourage you silently to pray something like this. Heavenly Father, here I am. I, I'm, I want to put my weight down as a, as, a, as a follower of Jesus. I recognize I need help. Lord Jesus, I recognize I need you. I cannot be, uh, I cannot be who you were. I cannot live the life that you lived. And so I am looking for you to forgive me of my sins and to guide and direct me. Spirit of God, I pray that you would fill me. I, I want to be a disciple of Christ. And I pray this asking this in Christ's name. And now I want to pray for the rest of us and say, Father, may we have some clarity about what a greater commitment, a greater faith would look like as we seek to become more like Christ and as we seek to, to lean in and to put our weight down. Guide us to that end. Give us eyes to see. Help us encourage one another to greater faith in you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.